Hi and welcome back to Garden Ninja. Now it's raining outside so it's definitely going to be a day to get inside and do some more design work. A number of you online have been asking me to show you more behind the scenes content on how I create my garden design renders. Now the render is the finished result of the design that really brings it to life as a 3D image and I use watercolours to do that. So whilst it's raining we're going to go inside and I'm going to hopefully show you in real time in one swoop how I do that. Now a number of you have also been asking me for help with remote garden design and I now offer that as a service. So if that's something that you're interested in, check out the description below where you'll get a link to my website so you can read more. But come on, let's get inside out of the rain. So the first thing that I usually do um, is obviously get my paintbrushes. So here I've got some water and I use these watercolours that come in little tubes and you can mix them into all sorts of different colours. Now for this design, I'm going to start off first by colouring in the large areas. So all the paving is going to go down first and then that way it can dry and then when I move on to more detail, I'm not going to have to go back over and start putting in big blocks of colour. It's just the way I work. So if I want to grey on my black, so I'm going to use a really wide brush for this because it's a large surface area. And with black paint, you've got to be so careful. You don't need much at all. I've got a bit of white there. Let's get a bit of black. You literally want a tiny dab. So I'm going to mix that together. What I tend to do is, if I've got large areas of paving that I'm going to be painting, although the paving might be really dark in real life, it may be almost like a black or a, a granite, um, I tend to lighten them on my renders. And for that reason, is if you put loads of dark colour on, what you will find is that it becomes rather oppressive and does take over the entire render. So you're only really wanting to give an artistic interpretation rather than a true life picture. So. Bear that in mind and that if you're going to add loads of heavy colour, especially in paving um, and even in grass it can happen, it can kind of take away the details. So with this really wide brush you'll be able to see on a close-up that I'm making really sort of um, broad paint swipes. I can go back and add a bit more detail later but yeah, that's pretty much it there. I work really fast with watercolours and the reason for that is um, I don't pre-wet my paper. So some people pre-wet their paper and what that means is that you can get these gorgeous, really long, sort of almost dreamy sections of colour that I go in dry, as it were, and, and work rather fast because you get a really solid colour and that's what I want. I don't really want too much dreaminess going on. So again, I'm going to use a stick brush, swipe that through there. There we go, we've got a pair. Awesome. If you've got too much paint, you can either dab it off in the palette or I use a bit of kitchen paper there. As you can see, I work really fast. This brush is now getting a bit too big for this. So, there we go. I've got my paving in. On there, let's give that a bit more detail. A bit of shading under there because that would be darker. And with shading, you can always come back at a later time during your painting to add a bit more depth. So, I'm really happy with that. I just realised I've got a circle here to paint as well. Let's get some of that in there. Perfect. Right, paving's in. So next, I'm probably going to do this turf. Again, it's a large end of the garden. Um, I don't want to use anything too vibrant because what you also find is you want to save your really bright colour pops for features and focal points of the garden. So if you've designed a gorgeous garden based on, say, a blue planting scheme, and that's really important, if you then start sticking really bright greens in for the turf, your blue will become muted and deadened. So, I'm going to use this brush here. Let's just check it's the right. That's still too bright. So I'm going to water that down even more. Let's have a look. Yeah, perfect. So, just a light wash with this green here. We'll go in. Water. There 
there we go. So you can add colour and then you can always like just wet your paintbrush and dilute it further. So as long as it's not dried, you can do that and that adds a really nice um, shade to the garden. You'll see that that's darker than the edge, so it gives you a little bit of sort of false depth. Let's go again over here. And again, you're just giving an interpretation. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, to, well, completely realistic. It's, it's your artistic interpretation to make this as, as lovely as you wish. Okay, so we've added the turf and now I've got a gravel path that comes to here. So again, it's one of the larger areas and needs a little bit of yellow. And because it's like a golden gravel, I'll probably add, yeah, a little bit of this ochre as well. The great thing about watercolours is they last forever and they're, they're relatively cheap. You can get cheap ones. Don't be too put off by student quality or artist pro. It's like the pigmentation might be slightly different. But if you're trialling this out, don't get into too much drama over the different paints. I certainly never have and I've been painting for years. So, okay, here we go. Let's have a look. Okay, that looks about right. So again, I'm just going to very quickly add this yellow. It will be really light. If I need it to be darker later on, I might add another layer. But for now, let's see if I move my hand, how quick my brush strokes are. I just find if you dither too much, or if you try and perfect it, it ends up looking forced. So, you know, if you go out the lines, it does not matter. I've just done it there. Do not panic. It gives it a sense of realism, as in someone's really painted it. You know, this is not Photoshop. Okay, so I've got the bulk of my stuff in. I'm now going to move on to these trees. I'm going to take, I've got a new green here, which is lovely. And there it is. Let's try this. So I'm going to do these trees, and the, the, le the level of detail now is going to start to increase. So I've got the basics in, and now it's about what are my focal points? What do I want to show off to the client and say, hey, look at this? And these um, multi stem trees are definitely something that I want to shout about. So, I'm going to wash that down a bit. I will give you some shots of what I'm doing with the paint because I know I'm just kind of expecting you to, to know this. Um, but I, I do water mine down quite a bit because I find I can always paint back over them um, if they're too dark. So, get that brush a white double track. Yeah, perfect. So, I've almost got this light, light khaki colour. What I like to do with multi stem trees is I paint almost like an outline, like this. Really fast again. I mean, if you want to paint slow, you can do. It just doesn't really suit my style. Maybe because I'm always on the clock or always having to reply to an email or do something I've forgotten about. But this is the way I like to paint. So I'm painting the outline really quickly. Da -da -da -da. And I actually find painting really therapeutic. So if you find yourself quite stressed, painting, even if it's just for fun, it's a really good way to sort of detach your mind from stress. Because other than me filming this now and having to annotate it, which is probably a little bit stressful, you've not got anything else to think about when you paint other than painting. It's a bit like reading or sowing seeds or any of that. It just really does free your mind up. There's the doorbell, I'll let someone else get that. Another tip is when you come to really fill it in, I usually get a piece of paper that I can put my palm under because what I've done in the early days is you get paint on your palm and then you end up with prints and have to start again, which is awful. So I've done the outline and then these multi stem is going to wet just like the, the tree. There we go. I'm going to wet that there as well, and what I'll do is in a second, I'll dip the paintbrush back in the green and just give a little, there we go, a little bit of green into that. And what the outline does, I find, is it helps give definition to the tree. If you call it all the same, it's just like a blob, it's like broccoli. We don't really want that, so I'm going to ever so slightly add a bit more pigmentation now, but only ever so slightly. Well, sometimes I may paint the trunks of these if the trunks of interest, like if it's a Puna Sala and the trunks like paper bark, I will paint them. But given these are going to be birch or um, Amelanchia, 
where really it's the foliage, I'm just going to leave them white. And another tip is that if you paint things white, you draw attention to them. Sorry, if you leave them white. Um, so when I come to painting the plants, you'll notice that I don't leave any white gaps because in the borders it immediately draws you out, which you don't want. I'm going to leave that table white because it's white in real life and it'll bring your attention to the patio as, ooh, what's that? And I'll probably leave the people white as well because it'll jump out. Okay, trees done. What are we on to next? So, um, I'll probably add the pops of colour last because they're going to be the real like, punctuation marks. But I've got quite a bit of greenery in this garden. And I've got three stone monoliths as well that I need to paint. So they're going to be focal points. We've got this green here. And this one's a new green again. And when you're using new colours, just always test them out. Don't dive straight into your render that you've spent, you know, weeks preparing maybe. Always give them a bit of a test. So that's really vibrant. So I probably want to dull that down ever so slightly. So we go deep green. With really deep colours like deep green or royal blue, I nearly always water them down because they're just too heavy on their own. So unless you're using them to punctuate, as I said before, they're just too much. So let's have a look at this one. Okay, so what am I going to do next? I'll probably do a light brush through all these grasses because there's loads of grasses in this garden. So let's give this a whirl. So, a little bit more, a bit too light that. Okay. So if you can see that, hopefully, you'll see. I'm just giving a bit of life to all these grasses. Now these are, I think, the panicums, panicum uh, morrowind or heavy metal. So these are really tall, column-like grasses that behave really well. And on this render, they make up a large chunk of the texture. So I'm going to give them all the same colour. Don't be too concerned with making them all dead uniform. Like, go nuts, you know. Free your fingers and just paint away. You might think, oh god, it's all the same colour, and what? there's loads of that green garden ninja. It doesn't matter because when you put your um, sort of focal point blobs of colour in, that green's just going to act as a really nice foil for them. But else we've got some here, la la la. I'll put a bit there. I tend to pick one colour to fill in gaps, so usually a green because most plants are green. But like round here, I know, oops, so I made a mistake there. Round there, this is what you need. Rotting paper, just soak that up quick. There we go, go. Right, so around here, as I was saying, in gaps, I tend to just paint in with that colour and then I'll leave space for the focal points. So we don't want any white, and I'm going to come, I'll come back to that later actually. Probably trying to do too many things at once. There's a grass, it's a bit light. If it is too light, like I said before, you can come back and add more depth with it. There's loads over there that I've missed as well. So as you can see, probably a few minutes in, I've done maybe 60-70%. I am a really fast painter. I'm not saying that's necessarily a good thing, but it is my style. So find your style and don't apologise for it. Um, whatever works for you. But with my experience, if you f what I call faff too much, if you dither, um, you can end up with kind of a disjointed look. So I tend to just get in there and get the majority of the colour in. Right, perfect. So we've done those grasses. I'm now going to move on. We've got some Hakonokloa, which is a Japanese forest grass. So let's try this. This is a new one. It's a bit of a bit of a uh, pastel green, I suppose. So let's give this one a whirl. And um, Hakonokloa looks around about here. Aha, nice. So, you can see there, I'm going to use that just to pull that colour through there. It might be a bit here, so let's have a bit there, a bit there, a bit there. Do, 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 do. This is looking lovely. Loads of hacker. Right, I need the paper. So before I start, I a piece of paper. So you can see it's all very technical. Again, I'll show you this now. This is this is a lifesaver for a lot of painters. Make sure your paper doesn't bleed either. Dip it in some water and see if the print comes off. 
And I will just use that. Ba -ba -ba. There we go. Hello, Hakana Kloa, you are lovely. You'll be able to see now it's like the white's drooping out of that stem. And you kind of get an idea, oh, there's something there. It's green. It's grassy. <laughs> there might be a bit more of it. There we go. Okay, so I've got that in. Still only on sort of colour four by this point. Just keep it simple. Um, what have we got? We've got the big blobs of shrubs, but they're going to be a bit heavier. How are we going to go in now with, we've got purples, pinks and a few blues in this. So, oh no, the monoliths. Let's get those in because they're heavy. They're going to be like a, a brownie grey. So we've already got grey there. What's that black? Yeah. Again, black is like enemy number one if you um, use the wrong amount, so you really don't want much at all. Right, that's not enough. Get in there, get in there. Mix, mix, mix. And I will, I'll show you some close-ups with the mixing. Right, now this is quite a, a pigment heavy colour, so I've got this fine brush. I'm going to give it a dab because I don't want to overpower it. Um, again, I need to be careful because I've got wet area there but you see how that's darker than the paving I think if I lift my arm maybe you can see better yeah that's a monolith which is like a slate stone sculpture so I want that to be heavy I probably there's one there as well I'll probably do a few coats on that all right there we go better to underpaint as well rather than getting every single line first time so if you try that usually can end up bleeding into other colours. So I'm going to stop before those little circles because they are Echinops and they're going to be blue. Okay, so we've got the monoliths. I'm going to start finding the colour. How exciting. So I need a purple. I've got a violet there. Again, heavy colour. You don't need much. I'll just dab it really. These will probably last me until I leave this mortal coil because I don't really use much of them. And that's the beauty when you're doing a garden design render is you're not painting a whole landscape. You know, you're not lathering the whole sheet of A3 with pigment. Um, you're being quite specific, so. Right, need a clean brush. Also with your water, um, you probably want to change it rather frequently if, you, if you're moving between colours. Because green's quite a, well, it's a light pigment, I suppose. If it was like a red or an orange, I'd change your water because you don't want those bleeding in because um, it can make everything feel really, really warm, which sometimes you don't want. Okay, perfect. Nice. So, again, this doesn't have to be perfect, but I just want to give the, um, the acknowledgement that there's colour and focal points. So I'm basically saying this is the theme, this is the style of the feeling, not there's going to be a verbena, it's living there. This is kind of an artistic interpretation of where things may go. So I'm going to start over here. And I think that's a, either an Agastache or what else have I got in this? Let's have a look. Oh, Nepita. So these are all that purpley pot plants. Nepita might be a bit more blue, I suppose, but you see, I'll do the flowers quite dark. I'll do that one there. That one's got to bleed. So if you if it looks like it's getting heavy at the bottom, I dry my brush and I go up and I pull them up. And that gives a more consistent colour. You can leave them if you want shade, but um, I don't. So that one's going to be blue. I need a bit more purple over here to give that impression. There we go. Blah blah blah. And some more down there. It's getting a bit light. A bit more pigment. Okay, so we've got a bit of purple there. I think that a bit more here actually. And don't be afraid to paint the foliage purple as well. I mean, it doesn't. It's not meant to be, you know, the most perfect representation of an Agastache or Verbena. It's, it's an interpretation, so don't panic. And when I first started, I spent got hours on these and would be torturing myself with the lack of realism. But if that's not your style and it's not mine, people call my style quite childish, which I'll take that, I don't mind. Um, as in, like, it looks like a children's illustration, but... Do you know what? Like, I know what these plants look like in real life, but a lot of the time clients don't, or they haven't seen them. So sometimes it's best to give them, you know, a, a, yeah, a child's view of these. It makes it easier to understand um, and gets your, your sort of vision across. Wow, look at that pop. So these are the Echinops. 
Again, I need to be careful. Follow one's own advice. Where are they? There they are. Look at that. Pow, pow, pow. Pow, pow, pow. I'll probably use a lighter blue wash for the bottom because if I pow, pow, if I was to use all of that, they turn into like big chunks, which you don't want. There's a lot one. Um, those will probably be lighter. There. Give that a bit more. There we go. And um, those are, yeah. So there's the blue. And if I use this one as well. So, Prussian blue. Political. <laughs> Maybe it's a little tiny dark that. Don't want much. Actually, another tip is I use a straw. You might be wondering what we're doing with this. You can use a pipette, but if you want to water down paints, a straw and you hold your finger on once you put it in the glass and then let go and it'll blob water into your palette, which I find really useful. Because if you keep dipping your brush back and forth, you just muddy your water, which means you need to clean it so refresh it more. Um, and it also just means that you're, you're spending less time painting and more time trying to sort out your water. Right, I need some white because that is a bit dark. I'm probably, I'm guessing, up to about maybe 10 minutes now. Maybe I shouldn't be showing how fast I do these. Maybe it will sort of negate my value. <laughs> but I think it's worthwhile showing you because especially if you're a new designer, or even a new painter, and I'm not saying that I'm an expert painter at all, most of what I do is self-taught, but this is what works for me. My clients always rave about them. Ah, there we go. So it's worthwhile sharing that knowledge because if I teach you this, it doesn't mean I forget how to do it. It just means that you can learn how to do it for yourself. So less drama, less panic, happier clients. What is not to love about knowledge? Share. We'll keep that pink and their pink and blah, 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 their pink. Yeah, so I think, yeah, I think we've got enough blue. But what I will do, is like I've said with that, um, I'll make that really mild. It's really second upside now, That's that'll be dry. So I'll just give a light wash. You see that? Light wash all around there. Yeah, I'll give it a light wash around there too. So it's giving you the indication that that area is going to be blue. Same there, light wash. A little bit more over here. Now, if I'd have used, oh gosh, that's not good. Let's pull that up, that's bled a little bit. If I'd have used that colour all the way, like I said, they would look like chunks of broccoli. So we do need a little bit of pink now, I'm just softening this up. Here we go. Pink, pink. This one is permanent, permanent rose. Ooh, moody. It's like I'm here to stay. And hopefully, when this garden gets fitted, it will be. Right, that's very rosy. Let's add a bit more water in it because it's a little bit too rose off Titanic. Right, perfect. So. All these little daisy flowers here are mallow or malice or wildflowers that are going to be pink. Braille. Now, because this is a light wash, I'll do the full shebang. So, pink, 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 pink up there, pink down here. I'll even do a foliage, I don't care, because it's a light wash and it's giving that indication again that that is pink. Where else are we? Got some here, yeah, pink, 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 pink. Give that indication this is all pink. Where else? You know, we need, need a bit there. So we'll do that one pink as well. We've got purple, blue, and pink, and you can start to see that it's really um, using those colours as a focal point. Everything else is just like really good background. They're like the background dancers and the, the lead singer with these colours. We do have a water feature, so I want to make that really obvious, which is here. Um, so I'm going to use dark pigment on that, and I'm going to be really careful with my hands because. There we go. Shaky hands. And then brush that up. Da, 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 da. There we go. Now for the rest of this, I'm probably going to use another green, uh, maybe a bit darker just to give like a, a weight to it. So what have I got? 
Barry's on his way in. Hello, Basbo. Oh, yeah, sap green. That's always a good one. We're, we're nearly, they say, nearly at the end. So we've got some shrubs to do, but sap green. Lovely. Right, so here we go. You see all that? There we go, it's a bit brighter. All these edging plants, the ground cover. Oh, we've missed one there. Um, it's all going to be this. Because we don't need everything singing and dancing. Any gaps, there we go. We'll be in this. Bit of a gap there. Same round here. You know, don't think that every single plant has to be individually coloured or that you need to sort of make everything sing at the same time. We've got fern there. Please remember that. So you'll see that now it's kind of like I'm just filling in a lot of space with a similar colour. Oh, I'm there. Oh, I'm there. And that connects everything, so we need to colour those. Um, and you'll see now by using this down here, it connects the whole garden. So, a bit in there, maybe a bit down there. There's another fern, we need to do something with that. There's a grass that can be that. If you can see with the white gaps now, they really stand out, and that's the, my point, that if you leave too much white, um, it draws your eye. So unless you want it to draw your eye, then don't. And these shrubs here are going to be um, either a hydrangea or a spirea that has white flowers. So I probably want those to be quite heavy um, and a dark colour, then the white blobs in them pop out as the flowers. So again, it's interpretation, um, but it's trying to kind of be, it'd be really obvious, I suppose, because when you look at this first stuff, I want you to know it's a purpley blue, um, wild and woody garden with, with pops of white. So um, be obvious if, if you need to be like that. Right, so there's another, that's a sap green, but I might, I'm going to go heavy with that, pretty heavy. Right, here we go, let's see, is this mega heavy? That's all right. So this is where I would urge a bit of caution. Because I want these to be white, you don't want to try and paint white over colour. It doesn't really work, it takes forever, always looks wishy-washy. And then if you overload the brush or the paper, it starts to go a bit weird. Another top tip, I suppose I've just taken for granted, make sure you're using proper watercolour paper. When I first, first, first started painting my renders, I used a sheet of just like high quality A3, which I usually hand draw onto. Did all this and then it just started to crinkle. It looked a mess, I had to redo it. Wasted a complete day, but learned a really valuable lesson, which is learn, learn, learn from your mistakes. And ask people. And if people don't want to tell you, that's fine. Um, I try and tell all my followers or clients everything about what I do. I love being a garden designer. I love being a, a very amateur watercolour painter, in this fashion anyway. Um, and if you want to learn or you want to ask questions and find out more, then I, you know, I, I want to share that with you because I get so much passion from this. And sometimes when you're trying to start something new or learn a new skill, it can feel like, oh gosh, I've got to go on a course or go to university or spend endless weekends um, listening to other people. But actually, I think you should just jump straight in and take the advice um, of anyone that's willing to give it. And for other designers, I think maybe we could all be a bit more willing to maybe share our skill and our passion with new people, whether they are designers or just want to be um, creative and artistic. So that's my rant over. Right, there's one I've missed. You'll now notice at this point, you start to notice stuff that you've missed, but because I paint fast, um, my preference, you will find that you can sort of jump back into areas because you've still got paint on your palette. It's not completely caked or dried. Let's check that. See how I always check it's the right colour. There we go. Um, these need some colour as well, which I think, I'm trying to think, I think they are meant to be blue. So let's give them, but no, we'll give them purple. Let's give them a bit of purple. Because it's primarily purple. So heavy on the flower, not so much underneath. Those could be purple as well, actually. It's always the danger zone when you're painting next to another colour that's going to bleed. There's another purple. 
Tu m'envoies ta morale, mais heureuse, ma mère, vraiment pas bonne. Bien, mon instant. Perfect. And when I say perfect, I don't mean this is like the Van Gogh of designs. I mean, I feel like, oh, that's, that's what I want it to be. So um, give yourself a little bit of praise as well. You, you know, you, you're probably going to be doing this on your own. I'm going to blend that in. Um, don't be too harsh, you know. Working on your own can be quite tricky at times, so definitely say to yourself, do you know what? Insert name here. You've done a really good job there. So yeah, I'm happy with that. Someone's now mowing outside. As always, just um, trying to work live. Now there's a stepping stone here that I've missed, so I need to just give that a little bit. A little bit too much paint on that. A bit of colour. Still too much paint. There we go, that's done. That there needs a little bit of a wash. So we'll put two blobs on, wet that brush, and then I'll blend that in. Now I'm being pedantic and I'm going to stop soon because another thing is make sure you stop before you do too much. And that's the same with all garden design, all planting. Um, you might think, oh, I've got one more plant I can squeeze in there. Stop. Because if you need it, you can come back to it. But Usually that last thing you want to do and you're tired and you're getting towards the end, you're gonna be like, oh, I'll draw in some more detail. Just stop, have a brew, have a congratulatory pat on the back and then come back to it. You can, um, if you do too much, you can't undo it. So we are getting near the end, blend, blend, blend. Um, what else? Is there anything else? Yes, the water feature is gonna be caught in steel, which is an orange color, again, using yellow ochre and a very small brush and a dry brush. I just and so want to give the hint of rusted steel. I don't want it to take over. So I'm going to use full pigment, no water. Tiny, tiny, tiny amount. And if you can see this on close up, I'm going to be so careful. Whoa. Can you tell I'm being careful because I've been quiet? Right, stop. And then, yeah, I think that's me done. So it's finished, I'll leave it up to dry. If you notice any bits on, don't rub them with wet fingers. I just blew it down to get a speck off, but um, I'll probably sign it. You should always sign the works that people know who's done it and then people don't sign the bit off. But that's pretty much it. So um, a very rambly way of showing you how I do my renders, but um, I've been asked to do it by a number of you. And hopefully that'll give you a bit more insight into how I create the renders. There's obviously a lot of work behind the scenes. You'll see that I've also got the plan here so I can kind of get a visual for where the plants are. Anyway, I've been Garden Ninja. For the first time ever, it's been one continuous shot. If you like what I do, please make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel where you can find, I think, over 110 garden design hints, tips and hacks video. Make sure you give it a thumbs up, ring a bell, share with your friends, ask questions in the comments. Uh, I'm trying to be as transparent as I can to help you and other gardeners and garden designers um, to get the most out of gardening. So thanks for watching. I'm Garden Ninja. Happy gardening.